Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining our Complete Count Committee train, training virtually. Um, this training is for all of our Complete Count Committees. Uh, this training is required for our $750 mini grant recipients. If you have not already applied for a mini grant, please consider applying as this training is a requirement. However, if you not, are not applying for a mini grant, this training will still be of use to you. So today during the training, it's going to take about a little over an hour. I'm going to do a quick introduction of myself, an overview of the census, uh, where it came from, and some of the logistics that are important for 2020. I'm going to talk about who we miss in Minnesota and what are the impacts of an undercount for our state. And then I'm going to go into tools for our complete count committees. So these tools are for everyone that's watching this video today. And then I'm going to end with a conclusion. So a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Rachel Dame. I am originally from North Carolina. As you can see on the screen, I have a barbecue map. I um, fall in the middle of that map, but the important thing to note is that tomato-based barbecue is better than vinegar and pepper-based barbecue. I say that I traded in barbecue for hot dish. I came out here for graduate school at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Um, I've always been inspired by how policy works in this state, and it's been great to continue on um, in my profession in Minnesota. Who do I represent? Uh, I represent my community, my neighborhood. I'm best to speak with my members of my friends and family and community. You know your community best, therefore you're best to speak with your community members. This is all about trusted partnerships with the 2020 census. So I also uh, do not represent a person that can drive in the snow. As you can see on the screen, my car is next to the car in flames. So this is two inches of snow, which is maybe a reason why we're having a online training during the winter right now. So census overview. Um, the first census happened in the United States in 1790. The census is part of our constitution. We must complete a census every 10 years. Now the first census in Minnesota happened in 1849. If you don't know, we became a state in 1858. Now in 2010, uh, the census was replaced with only the short form decennial census. So the short form is 10 questions only. Before 2010, some households would receive a short form. Other households would receive a longer form of the census, asking more in-depth questions such as, what's your job or income? Now we have the American Community Survey that's given every two years. So instead for the decennial census, we only have the short form. Now in 2020, it's unique because we have an online based version of the census. This is the first year that we are offering a digital census form, or I should say the federal government is implementing a digital census form. So 80% of households in Minnesota are going to receive an invitation to respond online. 20% of households are going to receive a paper based version of the census. Now that invitation to respond online, it's going to be a postcard about this size. Um, it's going to have a URL that you're going to go to to fill out your census form, and it's going to contain a unique user ID. Now that user ID is tied to your address. So when you go online to fill out your form, you're going to type in the user ID code. It's going to pull up your address. Now if you do not have an address, or you have a paper-based version of the form, but you would like to fill out your form online, that is still a possibility. You can go to the unique URL code and you'll just click uh, do not have a unique user ID, and then you're type, you'll type in your address manually. Um, I wanna say the census is available online, paper-based version, and phone as well. Now, key dates for 2020. Now, the census invitation to respond online or paper-based version of the form that will be going to households will happen between March 12th and March 20th. This is the initial invitation to respond to the census. Now, between March 26th and April 3rd is when the first and second reminder letter will be sent to households. These reminder letters are gonna say something like, hey, the census is here, make sure to fill out your form. 
If you answer the census in the initial grouping, say between March 12th and March 20th, great, you are not gonna receive any further communication from the Bureau. Now, April 1st is the official census day. So when I say official census day, the census asks, who is living in this household on April 1st? At the state and for our partners as well, we are trying to think of different activities that we can do to drive traffic towards the census on April 1st. So as a complete count committee, I'm asking you, what could you do in your community on April 1st? Here at the state, we're thinking of a variety of ideas. Um, right now, we are gonna have an event at the Capitol and thinking about doing uh, different activities throughout the state. I will touch base on this uh, later on via email, but I want you to start thinking about what you could do on April 1st. Now, following April 1st, between April 8th and April 16th is when the third reminder letter will be sent to households saying, fill out your census form. And then we have the paper-based questionnaire being sent to all households that have not completed their form yet. So say you're in a household that's in the 80% that are receiving an invitation to respond online. That's fine. You are eventually going to receive a paper-based version of the form. Now, if you want to receive a paper-based version of the form earlier in the process, you can call the Census Bureau and request a form be sent to your house. Now, between April 20th and April 28th, this is the final reminder letter about the census. This is the last reminder before census workers enter the field. Now, at this period, we will be able to see where people have self-responded across the state. So we can give you an update about where your community is in their self-response period. So um, say you have 70% of households that have self-responded in your community, you can see, okay, where else are we missing people and we need to do follow-up. Now at the state, if you have applied for a $750 mini grant, at this point, you will be eligible for additional funding if your, if your complete count committee is located in a census tract that has a high, low self-response rate. So say um, you are CCC and you're located in a community that has 20% of households have self-responded. Then the state will notify you that you will be receiving additional funding. We will determine which CCCs receive this funding. We anticipate that the funding will follow um, a map, which I will show later on, which shows the predicted low response scores across Minnesota. However, hopefully everyone watching this training today does not receive additional funding uh, because you have such a high self-response rate. Um, but I want to note that that money is only available to our CCCs that have applied for the $750 mini grant. So please apply for the funding. It is available and you will be maybe eligible for additional funding. Now, um, April 28th until late August is when census workers enter the field. A census worker is going to follow up with the household six times. It's going to be three times door knocking and three times phone call. The goal is to reach a household during a door knock because phone calls, uh, people don't have landlines, we might have a wrong cell phone number, and it's all about that relationship and talking that through. I'm going to go through later on as we speak about jobs in the census as well. I want to say there is fear around the census. We at the state of Minnesota recognize that fear. And we want to give every community member as much information as possible so they can realize how the census can be used as a tool of empowerment. So types of census forms and enumeration. There's a short form, which is the most widely distributed census form. We have the group quarters form and enumeration. And then we have enumeration for Native American reservations. Now group quarters enumeration. There are four types of group quarters enumeration processes. The two processes at the bottom, in-person interview and paper response data collection, are for group living quarters facilities that are more transient. So think if somebody's staying one or two nights only in that group living quarters facility, they're gonna maybe go through the paper response data collection and in-person interview. Now, electronic response data transfer, that is very common for dormitories or for a population that is high need and might not fill out their census form individually. So this is when the facility manager answers the census for everyone that's living in that group facility quarter. And then drop off pickup questionnaire is dropping off a paper-based version of the form, having everyone fill it out and then picking it up at a specified time. The key for our complete count committees, what I want you to know, is between February 3rd and March 6th 
is when the Census Bureau is going to be making advanced contact with the group living quarters throughout Minnesota. So around March, maybe just check in with some of the group quarters that you work with or are that located in your community and make sure that the census has contacted them and that they have chosen the different type of enumeration process for the 2020 census. As you can see at the bottom of the slide, slide there are various dates with uh, the different group quarters enumeration process and how that will happen. So with the group quarters, their form is slightly different only by two questions. I have an example up here on the screen. Um, it says, do you live here or stay here most of the time? Yes or no. Other than here, what is an address that you may use? So uh, say we have a student on a college campus and they are living in the dorm room, which is where they should be counted since they're living there the majority of the year, uh, but their parent happens to put them on their census form. That's fine. Uh, this allows us to deduplicate the data on the back end to see that the student um, should be counted in the dormitory and not at the parent's address as well. Now, if an individual does not have another address, totally fine, they can leave that question blank. So I'm gonna go through the 2020 census form. This is what the form looks like. These are the questions that are going to be on the form. Um, it is what is going to print as we speak right now. So there are four questions that apply to the entire household. Now, one individual will answer the census form for every person in that household. Now, I live with roommates. Say my roommate answered the census form and I answered the census as well. That's fine. It'll deduplicate the data on the back end. But the four questions that are asked about the entire household are how many people were living here, staying here on April 1st? As you know, April 1st is census day. Uh, were there additional people staying here on April 1st? Is this a house, mobile home, apartment? And then what is your telephone number? The reason the Bureau is asking for your telephone number is in case they need to follow up about a question with your form. So say for example, I answer my form and I say there are three people living in this apartment, but I only count two people on the census form. That's gonna flag the Census Bureau and they're gonna see that I might be missing somebody from my form. So they would follow up with a phone call. Now online, the phone call is not mandatory. So you are able to skip that question now, there are six questions that are asked about each individual person living in the household. These are the demographic type of questions. I'm gonna go through each question individually. So the first question is name. Now online, if somebody does not put in a name, it's gonna trigger something and it's gonna ask you to put some sort of name in. You could put a name such as individual one in that box. We are encouraging everyone to fill out their census in its entirety, but I want to say that this is a self-identifying form, so it is how you identify yourself. Um, and then question two, we have relationship to person one. This year in 2020, we have expanded categories within this question. Question three is what is this person's sex? Now, if an individual does not identify as male or female, like I said, this is a self-identifying form. So you are able um, to only answer what you feel comfortable answering and how you identify. Now, question four is key. This is age and date of birth. Now in 2010, there were two mandatory questions that um, were mandatory to say that you had a completed census form. When I say completed so that you were counted in the state of Minnesota and that the resources came back to the state and we could provide all the services to our community members. So the questions in 2010 were age and date of birth and race. We anticipate that those will be the same questions in 2020. We are not sure at, this, at the moment what they will be. However, as soon as we have that information, we will relay that with our partners. So with age and date of birth, it is going to ask for your age and years and your age um, and month, day and year of birth. However, if somebody does want to skip this question, it is going to trigger that you at least enter something in either years or month, day and date of birth. So for example, for myself, um, I could say 27 years old and maybe not put in my birthday. That is a possibility. Um, like I said, it's a self-identifying form. Question five is Hispanic and Latino ethnicity. Um, at the bottom, it has a place if you wanted to put in, yes, you are Hispanic or Latino ethnicity and write in your ethnicity if it is not in one of the groupings above. Now, question six is what is this person's race? 
Now, if an individual answers multiple categories within the race question, for example, you identify as white, African American, and American Indian, in the data we are able to see that 5,000 people have identified as, three as these three races. So it doesn't lump everyone into one race category. We can see how many people identified as a number of races in the data set. Um, at the bottom is an area if you want to say some other race and write in your race there. Now, I'm encouraging everyone to write in um, the race. So if there is a high number of people that are writing in a race that is not listed in the boxes above, we could see our census form changing in 2030 because our demographics are shifting across the United States. So the form would slightly change and it would show that we have a high population of this race um, in America right now. Moreover, if uh, say within the white question within race, um, if somebody is Egyptian and they don't identify as white, that is fine. They can put some other race and write in Egyptian down at the bottom. I want to say there will not be a citizenship question on the 2020 census. Our office is very happy about that. The questions that I just showed you, there are 10 questions. This is what the online form is going to look like. This is what the printed form is going to look like as well. Do I have to answer every question on the census? No, you can submit a partially completed census form and still be counted in the state of Minnesota. So what that means, going back to the mandatory questions that I talked about, age, date of birth, and race were the mandatory questions in 2010 to be counted. Now in 2020, we're not sure what they are. However, as soon as I, we have the information, we will let you know. However, a partially filled out census questionnaire may result in a phone call or a visit from a census worker. We anticipate that it's going to be a phone call follow-up. However, it could be a visit. Now with the online form, if somebody does not have a physical address, they are able to put another address in that form, such as maybe a library or a school or a community gathering place. So that is an option for individuals as well. Um, if somebody does not put an address or put, say, a library address on their form, it is important to note that it'll show that that household was not counted in the census, so the Census Bureau will follow up with a door knock. So language information. The census is printed and given online and over the phone in 12 other languages than English. One of those languages is Spanish. However, in Minnesota, um, we have different languages here at our state. So Somali and Hmong um, are prevalent languages in our community. So there are guides, identification cards, and glossaries to help with this language process. The ideal situation is that the person or census worker following up with the household already speaks that language. So we're not using the guides, glossaries, identification cards. However, if need be, these are a resource that is available. So the guides I'll go through on the next slide, but um, they're in, going to be available in video with print um, and in braille as well. Now there is a census questionnaire assistance and this is a telecommunication device for individuals that are deaf or hard of hearing. And then we have language identification cards. So as you see on the screen, if a household spoke Hmong, it allows the census worker to identify the language that is spoken in that household. And then the language glossary is a translation of commonly used terms. Now language guides. I have on the screen uh, the English language guide. It's an example. Uh, we will provide the document library resources through the Census Bureau site. We're going to have a link to that in our follow-up email to you. But as you can see on the screen, uh, this guide shows how to answer the question about your name and where to put in that information. So Census Bureau staff identification. Now the coloring of the badges might be slightly different. However, the five key identifiers are the same. So the first identifier is the badge that the Census Bureau staff are wearing should have their full name. It should have a picture on the badge. Now the picture should match the individual that is showing up at your household. And it's gonna have a Department of Commerce watermark, expiration date, and identification number. Now Census Bureau workers will only be working between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. They will have their badge present on them at all time and it must be visible when they're knocking at your door. Uh, they will also have a bag with official census letterhead, 
Um, they will have tablets with them to help when they are door knocking to go through uh, the form with the household. Now, if you wanted to verify a census worker even further, that is a possibility. You could call the Chicago Regional Office. I have the number posted here. Or you could go on the website and do a staff search to see um, by putting in the identification number on the badge and verifying that that census worker is who they say they are. So I've done a staff search with um, some of the great census workers that we have here in Minnesota, and I've never had a problem. They've always showed up on the screen and I was able to verify that individual. So who can access the data? The White House cannot access the data. Your landlord cannot access the data. Um, in 2010, I had more people living in my house than were on my lease. The landlord didn't know that. He did not have access to the census data. Uh, government entities like ICE or the US court system, they do not have access to this data as well. The state of Minnesota, myself included, we don't have access to this data. The only person that can access census data is the US Census Bureau. Now this data, um, how does the census protect your data? So uh, the census is gonna be using an HTTPS address rather than an HTTP address for the online form. And with that S, uh, that's just another security measure. So it means that your data is encrypted on your computer and stays encrypted as you fill out that form and it's transited to the Bureau's um, servers, which is over in Suitland, Maryland. And then uh, the U.S. government, the form's also going to be on a .gov website. Uh, .gov websites are difficult to receive and only government entities can have them. And then the Census Bureau uses best practices uh, to prevent somebody from breaking in their server. Uh, there's a GAO report that I will share with everyone, and it talks about some of the data security measures that the Census Bureau is doing to ensure that everything is protected. Now, your data is protected um, and kept private for 72 years. So I don't think anyone maybe if you're a baby and you're watching this, will be around for 72 years from now. Um, so the census data will be released in 2092. So funny story, I was actually able to go and look and see who lived in my house 72 years ago. At that time, I could see what their job was. It was asking more detailed questions. But if you want to be counted in the data, it is important that you fill out your census. Otherwise, you are invisible for the rest of history. So, who is missed in Minnesota? Um, historically, young children, people of color, indigenous people, and low urban and rural low-income households are missed at disproportionately high rates. So in Minnesota, the groups that are most likely to be missed uh, are renter households. Uh, then we have children zero to four is another group that is likely to be missed in the census. Young adults, uh, individuals 18 to 24, are actually second most likely to be missed in the census following renter households, and then racial and ethnic minorities. So some of the numbers on this screen uh, might, look, might look off to you, and that is because they probably are. And what this means is that we have incorrect data. So when we have incorrect data at the state of Minnesota, we are generating policies that don't accurately reflect the needs of our community. We need to have accurate data so we can have policies that are great for our community and can be implemented correctly. I also wanna point out that the census is the only form of data available. There is not another federal agency conducting this high level data. We don't have a private entity going out there and collecting census data as well. So this is what the private, public, and nonprofit sector are all using. They're using this data set. So in Minnesota, our projected non-self-response numbers, so that means individuals or households that aren't going to answer their census form without a follow-up from the Bureau, either door knock or phone call, is 965,000 people. That is a huge number for our state. If we missed 965,000 people, we're going to lose our eighth congressional seat. So as a state, we would redistrict in 2022 as a state, we would lose federal funding. So the federal funding that comes to the state of Minnesota would no longer trickle down to the county and city level. So you might see an increase in property taxes to account for the loss of funding. Now in the metro area, um, these are our undercounts. So as you can see for the metro area, the total projected non-self-response number is roughly 534,000 people. 
I'm gonna share a document with you in the follow-up email that has the projected non-self response numbers for all the counties and cities in Minnesota. So, impacts of an undercount. As a state, we receive $15 billion a year in federal funding. This funding comes to us at a state and then it comes down to the county and to the city level. Now, if you watch John Oliver, we were recently featured on the show and it talked about a community in Minnesota, Circle Pines specifically. And Circle Pines uh, was undercounted uh, by eight, well, they were didn't reach the 5,000 person mark in 2010 by 82 individuals. So they were not eligible for state highway trunk funds. They also had an undercount in their community. So this year, Circle Pines uh, is working very hard to make sure that they reach that 5,000 person mark and they have a complete count. So they are eligible for the funds that they deserve. So not only does this affect us at the state level, it affects us at the city and county level as well and our neighborhood too. So decreased representation in Washington, D.C. So I talked about that eighth congressional seat. We are projected to either keep our eighth congressional seat or lose an eighth congressional seat. No matter where somebody falls politically, we want to make sure that our voice as Minnesotans is heard in Congress and that we do not lose um, our voice in the Electoral College. So um, also decreased growth and resources for your community. We recently have an Aldi in my neighborhood, which I'm very excited about. That Aldi is in our community because it looks like we have a population growth in my neighborhood. There are food desert areas across Minnesota that have a high population, but if they're not accounted for in the data, then private businesses aren't going to locate stores or grocery stores or things of that nature in that community. So like I said, businesses are also using census data. If you think about Target, they're using census data to determine where they're gonna place Target stores across the state of Minnesota. So looking at the election data projections, Minnesota is projected to either lose a congressional seat or keep the same number of seats. I wanna say we are lucky to live in a state that values the census and values a complete count and accurate data. There are other states um, listed, some on the left and some on the right, that are not putting any money towards their census. The state of Minnesota is putting money towards the census and we are working hard to make sure that we get this complete count. So you're not really meant to read all of these programs on the next slide, but these are the 55 federal programs that are funded using census data. There are a variety of programs that connect to people's lives. So a few, uh, this is a program I wanna say called Counting for Dollars. It's out of George Washington University. So to pick a few of the federal programs, um, we have uh, Medicaid. As a state, we receive $6 billion a year in federal funding for Medicaid. That funding is using some form of census data. Now, federal transit grants. As a state, we receive $76 million a year in federal transit grants. That is using some form of census data to trickle the money down to our state. Now, if somebody says the census does not connect with my life, ask them if they took uh, a road today to get to their office or to go to the grocery store. If they did, that road was paved, uh, there was snow was plowed off the road, and that's because we have funding to support those activities. The reason we have funding is because we have a population here. Now, if we have an undercount, we're going to lose money, and we can't support uh, paving the roads, fixing potholes, plowing them. So it's very important that we have this complete count. The census can impact some aspect of anyone's life. Often when I speak to college students, um, I was talking to a group yesterday and they were saying how a lot of the students were using Pell Grant funding to go to school. Pell Grants use some form of census data. Other federal programs, such as the Low Income Energy Assistance Program, which ensures that households have electricity and heat, especially in the winter months, that is fully funded using census data. So the impact of an undercount for our community does not only affect us fiscally, but it's going to last 10 years. We are not able to redo our census until 2030. So if we're missed now, we're gonna to have to deal with that impact for t uh, 10 years, and that's gonna be detrimental for our state and community. So why do you care about obtaining a complete count? Everyone's why is going to be vastly different, but the goal as a complete count committee or as a partner is to help individuals understand why the census matters and why it specifically matters to them. So if you wanna find your community and see where their projected low response rates are across the state, 
please go to our website and take a look at our response outreach area mapper. It's called the Rome map. I'm pointing to um, a census tract, and I keep using the term census tract. I want to point out that a census tract is multiple zip codes. Um, it's a way to de-identify the data. So I'm pointing to a specific census tract there, and the projected low self-response rate is 20 to 29 percent. So um, there is also a response outreach area mapper on the Census Bureau's website. This map is very useful. Um, it's more robust than our Rome map, but it allows you to overlay school districts, congressional districts, anything of that nature. Um, I have two census tracts pulled up on the screen and I wanna point something out here. So on the left-hand side, we have census tract 361 with a low uh, response score of 32%. In this tract, we have a median household income of roughly 21,000. Now we're just gonna move one census tract over um, to census tract 606.03. We have a low self-response score here of 12%, with now a median household income of roughly $111,000. So what happens is the census tract on the right, they have more people counted. So um, all those resources are going to go back into that community. Now, the census tract on the left that has the 32% undercount, they could use some of the resources and they deserve the resources, but they're undercounted, so the resources aren't going back into that community and they're not receiving their fair share of federal dollars. So with these undercounts, it's important that we have equal distribution and that people are counted so we can share the resources how people and to the communities that deserve them. So um, when a community is not counted in the census, they remain invisible. They remain invisible in the data set um, and they don't sh receive the fair share of resources that they deserve. So preventing an undercount, it's a lot of depressing information, but the way at the state of Minnesota that we are going to work to prevent an undercount is through partnerships. Um, these partnerships are specifically going through our complete count committees. So complete count committees are local organizations or governments or everyday citizens that have a role in ensuring a complete count in their community and help mobilize census operations. Right now, as I'm filming this video, I think we have roughly 257 complete count committees for the state. To give you an idea, um, Iowa just started their first statewide complete count committee, so they have one. I believe Washington State has 10 complete count committees. So as a state, we're doing well, and it's because of the work that you are doing and the fact that you're taking time to watch this video that we are going to have a complete count in Minnesota. So on our website, we have a complete count map. It shows all of the complete count committees across the state. You can click on a dot on this map and see who's leading that complete count committee, what their name is, phone number, email address um, is as well. And we have a table at the bottom that lists all the complete count committees. So say you're a government complete count committee, you can see the different nonprofit complete count committees in your community. So tools available to our complete count committees. So the first one, I'm gonna go through each of these tools, but I wanna talk about digital engagement first. This is required of our complete count committee mini grant recipients. Digital engagement is a vague term for a reason. So mass email, mass texting, uh, using a commit to be counted form, which I'll talk about, embedding the help desk on your website. These are all forms of digital engagement. Facebook is any form of social media. So use a digital engagement strategy that works for you, but it is required that you do some form of digital engagement. That is how we are gonna monitor that you are using your grant. Uh, later on down the line, we will follow up and ask, what type of digital engagement did your complete count committee use? So with digital engagement, we are offering our partners a commit to be counted form. Now this is similar to a commit to vote form. With the commit to be counted form, you can embed this form on your website and it's a way to digitally collect information um, about individuals that might be going to your site. And then you can communicate with these individuals about the census later on. Now this form might be useful for some partners. Other partners might already have a similar system or have a database of information and might not find this form as useful. However, if you do wanna use commit to be counted, please let us know in the follow-up email that we will send you. But uh, the instructions for this form is that you're gonna embed the C2BC form on your website. 
the State Demographic Center, that is myself and um, four and a half other people, are going to follow up with your complete count committee and give you an Excel document of everyone that signed up under your unique C2BC link. And then we ask that you communicate with individuals that committed to be counted for the 2020 census. Now we also are offering a community motivator tool. This is a mass texting tool. It's a way for you to send a message to all of the community members that you work with. So how it works, uh, there are detailed instructions, which we will pass along, is you will load um, an Excel document into the Community Motivator tool, and then you will send a welcome message saying, hey, would you like to receive updates about the census? And it has an opt-in message, yes or no. If a person opts in, great, then they will be added to a list for further communication from your CCC. Now, I will say that um, we are seeing the messages that will be sent out, so we'll be approving them so nobody can just send out 20 messages on one random day. But on April 1st, we're gonna say asking our partners to send out a message to all the individuals through the Community Motivator tool. Now this tool is also linked to the Commit to be Counted form, so if you wanted to collect information via Commit to be Counted, you could use those phone numbers and then upload it into Community Motivator. We are also offering a help desk. Now the help desk is available in Hmong, Somali, and Spanish. Uh, Hmong and Somali, we're still working through the rapid response, but with this help desk, it's where you ask a question and you will receive a real-time answer. The help desk is available on Facebook, WhatsApp, um, text message, and you can embed it on your site. Now, if you're using the texting code, it's MN2020662020. So feel free to take out your cell phone right now and ask a question about the 2020 census. All of the answers remain anonymous. We are not collecting additional information. Um, we're just trying to have a way for residents um, here in Minnesota to ask a question and receive a real-time answer. Now the help desk um, is linked to the community motivator tool. In the sense that if somebody asks a question, after that question is answered, it is going to prompt um, the user and say, would you like to receive further updates about the census? If the individual says yes, they will be added to our list and receive limited communication about the census in the future. Now we are also offering communication support to all of our partners. So with this support, uh, you will receive regular email updates with sample messages about specific census themes. When I say regular email updates, about once a week you will receive a message from our office. If you're watching this video, I have your email address, so you are on our listserv. Um, the email will include sample mess social media messages, uh, accessible translated documents, if we have any to share with you, uh, newsletter messages, news clips, anything of that sort. It also, we have various themes of these communication support email messages. So various themes would be jobs with the census, outreach to multi-unit housing, um, census day on April 1st. Also, we have a website and we have a variety of content on our website. This website is meant to be used as a resource. It's a one-stop shop where you can go and find updates about the census. I wanna say on our website right now, all the videos in English only are available. Please share these videos. It's a way to watch two minutes and see what's gonna happen with the census in 2020. Now the videos in Spanish, Somali, and Hmong, these, those are going to be available January 15th and posted to our website as well. Now on the website, we have handouts. So both the handouts you see here um, will be translated into Spanish, Somali, and Hmong, and all of them are accessible. So on the left, we have Census 101. On the right, we have, uh, it's the Counting for Dollars handout talking about the fiscal impacts of census data for Minnesota, going off that $15 billion number that we receive as a state and federal funding. So please go use these handouts. Uh, there will be flyers posted to our site. Go look at the flyers and use them as you see fit. We have unlocked logos on our site. So if you wanted to say, we count uh, Minneapolis instead of we count Minnesota, that is a possibility. So it's another way to localize the message of the census. Social media. We have Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. All of our handles are at MN2020census. So since you're on your phone right now, uh, hopefully watching this presentation or texting the help desk, please uh, open up one of your social media sites and follow us. 
If you have any content, feel free to tag us and we will repost it. We're gonna do a variety of social media pitches around April 1st, so you are aware that we are thinking in that capacity. And then the hashtag is WeCountMN. Census materials. On our website at well, as well, at the top navigation bar, there's a link to our store. You can use the $750 mini grant to buy a variety of census materials. You can also localize those materials. So instead of saying you bought a koozie and you want it to say, we count Rochester, it can say we count Rochester instead of saying we count Minnesota. And these materials will be shipped to you directly. It's about a two week turnaround. One size does not fit all. So I covered a variety of tools that we are offering. Um, you know your community, it's trusted partners. Choose the tools that work best for you. Now jobs with a census. We need 40,000 applicants to fill roughly 12,000 jobs. As I'm speaking right now, we don't even have 20,000 applicants. So we really need people to apply and we need people to apply from every community because the goal here is to have somebody walking out their front door and talking to their neighbors about the census. Now, non-US citizens can apply for jobs with the Census Bureau. An individual only needs to work a five hours of minimum a week. Uh, it's flexible hours, including some days, evenings, weekends. You get to choose your schedule. As I mentioned, you work between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Uh, the pay is actually increased across the state. So right now, I think the lowest number pay is $16.50 an hour, and it goes up to $27 an hour. So please apply. Um, if you are interested in applying, I have a link to the website on the PowerPoint. If you would like to check your application status, there is a phone number there as well. Now, right now, is when the Census Bureau is recruiting for jobs. They are going to make job offers in January between April. Census taker training is going to happen in March. So if you have applied for a job and you haven't heard back yet, um, you should start hearing back in January and February and Mar um, in March and April. Uh, census taker training is paid as well. If for some reason you had to drive, uh, you are reimbursed for the federal gas rate. And then um, work with the census would happen between March and July, potentially August. I wanna talk about libraries. So the role of libraries in the 2020 census. So we're currently working to make sure that every library in Minnesota or the majority of libraries serve as questionnaire assistance centers. Now this is a place where somebody could go to have assistance with their census form. Also, it's a digital access point, so the libraries will have a designated space or computers that people could use to fill out their form. If they had any questions, the librarians would direct somebody to the help desk or they would also be able to answer that question. So if you ever want to direct somebody to a location to have help with their form, send them to your local library. We are also going to be posting this information on our website as well under the QAC tab. Apartments. So renters are the number one group that is likely to be missed in the 2020 census. So we are asking cities and counties to pass ordinances um, about having census workers access an apartment. So an ordinance, um, it only strengthens the existing federal statute that says census workers must be granted access to an apartment building. However, we want an ordinance that is at the city and county level that granted, grants access to an apartment building to a census worker and also requires um, an apartment owner to give residents notice that the census is coming. So we see this as an access and an information campaign. Access in the way that census workers aren't trying to sneak into a building and pretend to be a pizza delivery person. Um, and information in the sense that residents that are renters know that the census is coming. And so they're aware of that and they can go online, maybe fill it out paper-based version, or when somebody knocks on their door, they know what they are there for. Um, Edina was the first city to pass a city or county or city or county ordinance. So uh, we are sharing their ordinance with you if you would like to copy their message as well. I'm gonna say we are not meant to know everything. There are gonna be more questions about the census. Our office uh, is trying to gather as much information as possible and share it with you. If you ever have questions, don't hesitate to follow up. We will answer them to the best of our abilities. We are all here working together to make sure that we have a complete count in Minnesota. So fall from the state, 
This is my contact information, my email address, that is my cell phone number, so please use it sparingly. All the handouts are located on our website. I'm going to send a follow-up email to everyone. It's going to talk, have the Rome map, this PowerPoint, the projected undercounts, a variety of resources for you. Um, this is our website at the bottom, imin.gov slash admin slash 2020 census. If you haven't already, please join our third Thursday calls. You can go to our website and under the events tab, it shows the call-in information for third Thursday. These calls are a way to update all of our partners about what the state of Minnesota is doing around the census. Also, if you miss a call, uh, that is fine. Just email me and we'll send you a recording of the third Thursday call. Now, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to respond to our email that we send in a follow-up message. So thank you so much for watching this. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to view this video. And if you have any questions, please let me know.